as promised in yesterday's video, today will be an excerpt from the Legends book Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader. We will go over Vader's thoughts about his new suit and cybernetics and everything in between, including his poor vision, his scorched vocal cords, his burnt lungs, and much more. Our scene today takes place in the Jedi Temple, where Emperor Palpatine sent Vader back to, to gather a lost holocron. During his scavenge, he reminisced about many things, which I've made videos on as well. However, today's will be this topic. Without further ado, let's begin. Vader turned and moved for the hatch. But this is not walking, he thought. Long accustomed to building and rebuilding droids, supercharging the engines of land speeders and starfighters, upgrading the mechanisms that controlled the first of his artificial limbs, he was dismayed by the incompetence of the medical droids responsible for his resurrection in Sidious's lofty laboratory on Coruscant. His alloy lower legs were bulked by strips of armor similar to those that filled and gave form to the long glove Anakin had worn over his right arm prosthesis. What remained of his real limbs ended in bulbs of grafted flesh, inserted into machines that triggered movement through the use of modules that interfaced with his damaged nerve endings. But instead of using Durasteel, the medical droids had substituted an inferior alloy and had failed to inspect the strips that protected the electromotive line. As a result, the inner lining of the pressurized bodysuit was continually snagging on places where the strips were anchored to the knee joints and ankle joints. The tall boots were a poor fit for his artificial feet, whose claw-like toes lacked the electrostatic sensitivity of his equally false fingertips. Raised in the heel, the cumbersome footage canted him slightly forward forcing him to move with exaggerated caution lest he stumble or topple over. Worse, they were so heavy that he often felt rooted to the ground, or as if he were moving in high gravity. What good was motion of this sort, if he was going to have to call on the force to even to walk place to place? He may as well have resigned himself to using a repulsor chair and abandoned any hope of movement. The defects in his prosthetic arms mirrored those of his legs. Only the right one felt natural to him, though it too was artificial and the pneumatic mechanisms that supplied articulation and support were sometimes slow to respond. The weighty cloak and pectoral plating so restricted his movements that he could scarcely lift his arms over his head, and he had already been forced to adapt his lightsaber technique to compensate. He could probably adjust the servo drivers and pistons in his forearms to provide his hands with strength enough to crush the hilt of his new lightsaber. With the power of his arms alone, he had the ability to lift an adult being off the ground. But the Force had always given him the ability to do this, especially in moments of rage, as he had demonstrated on Tatooine and elsewhere. What's more, the sleeves of the bodysuit didn't hug the prosthesis as they should, and the elbow-length gloves sagged and bunched at his wrists. Gazing at the gloves now, he thought, this is not seeing. The pressurized mask was goggle-eyed, fish-mouthed, short-snouted, and needlessly angular over the cheekbones. Coupled with a flaring dome of helmet, the mask gave him the forbidding appearance of an ancient Sith war droid. The dark hemispheres that covered his eyes filtered out light that might have caused further injury to his damaged corneas and retinas, but in enhanced mode, the half-globes reddened the light and prevented him from being able to see the toes of his boots without inclining his head almost 90 degrees. Listening to the servo motors that drove his limbs, he thought, this is not hearing. The med droids rebuilt the cartilage of his outer ears, but his eardrums, having melted in Mustafar's heat, had been beyond repair. Sound waves now had been transmitted directly to implants in his inner ear and sounds registered as if issuing from underwater. Worse, the implanted sensors lacked sufficient discrimination, so that too many ambient noises were picked up and their distance and direction were difficult to determine. Sometime the sensors needled him with feedback, or attached echo or vibrato effects to even the faintest noise. Allowing his lungs to fill with air, he thought, this is not breathing. Here, the med droids had truly failed him. From a control box he wore strapped to his chest, a thick cable entered his torso, linked to a breathing apparatus and heartbeat regulator. The ventilator was implanted in his hideously scarred chest, along with tubes that ran directly into his smoke-damaged lungs, and others that entered the throat, so that should the chest plate or belt panels develop a glitch, he could breathe unassisted for a limited time. But the monitoring panel beeped frequently, and for no reason, and the constellation of light served only as steady reminders of his vulnerability. The incessant rasp of his breathing interfered with his ability to rest, let alone sleep. 
and sleep, in the rare moments it came to him, was a nightmarish jumble of twisted, recurrent memories that unfolded to excruciating sounds. <laughs> The Medroids had at least inserted the redundant breathing tubes low enough so that, with the aid of an enunciator, his scorched vocal cords could still form sounds and words. But absent the enunciator, which imparted a synthetic bass tone, his own voice was little more than a whisper. No, I am your father. He could take food through his mouth as well, but only when he was inside a hyperbaric chamber, since he had to remove the triangular respiratory vent that was the mask's prominent feature. So it was easier to receive nourishment through liquids, intravenous and otherwise, and to rely on catheters, collection pouches, and recyclers to deal with liquids and solid wastes. But all those devices made it even more difficult for him to move with ease, much less with any grace. The pectoral armor that protected the artificial lung weighed him down, as did with electrode-studded collar and supported the outsized helmet, necessary to safeguard the cybernetic devices that replaced the uppermost of his vertebrae, the delicate systems of the mask and the ragged, scars in his hairless head, which owed as much to what he had endured on Mustafar as to attempts at emergency trephination during the trip back to Kors and aboard Cides' shuttle. The synth skin that substituted for what was seared from his bones itched incessantly, and his body needed to be periodically cleansed and scrubbed of necrotic flesh. Already he had experienced moments of claustrophobia, moments of desperation to be rid of the suit, to emerge from the shell. He needed to build, or have built, a chamber in which he could feel human again, if possible. All in all, he thought, this is not living. This was solitary confinement, prison of the worst sort, continual torture. He was nothing more than wreckage, power without clear purpose. A melancholy sigh escaped from the mouth grill. Collecting himself, he stepped through the hatch. So, now we can see just how depressed Vader was, and all the things he felt and thought after his transformation. It really is eye-opening to read just what he went through and with such imagery. I can't imagine how he continued to live this way for so many years, trapped in his own synthetic skin, entombed within his thick suit and mask. He was truly miserable. The only time he felt free and without much pain was when he retreated to his back to tank in Rogue One. This really changes how we look at Vader from now on as it shows his mortality and reason for depression. As if losing Padme and turning on the Jedi wasn't enough, he was living through hell every day, with Palpatine holding the pitchfork. Do you empathize with Vader? Let me know and I'll reply with you. Thanks for watching today's episode, everyone. I really appreciate it. I'll see you all in tomorrow's episode of Star Wars Theory. Same time, same place. Until then, my fellow Jedi and Sith friends, the Force will be with you.